Once a year, our geophysical field exercises take place in the Hegau near Lake Constance. The Hegau is of volcanic origin and is therefore interesting for geophysical measurements. Students use different methods to determine the location and properties of volcanic anomalies in the subsurface. In hammer seismics, seismic waves are generated with a hammer which are then measured using geophones. The method is particularly suitable for investigations on shallow subsurfaces. It determines the elastic properties of the different rock formations and the location of the layer boundaries between them. Hello and welcome. The field exercise will take place in two weeks and to be sure that the measuring instruments work, we will have to test them. That is precisely what we are doing here on the grounds of the Geophysical Institute at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. Today, together with my colleagues, I will show you how to set up a hammer seismic experiment, perform the measurement and evaluate the measurement data using a simple method. During this process, you will learn practical things, such as how to install geophones, how to operate a hammer and how to connect both to the recording unit. In addition, you shall also learn how to make a simple travel time curve from the measurement data and from this to determine the propagation velocity of seismic waves and the depth of the top surface layer using the intercept time method. For this, we need a hammer to generate seismic waves, a chain of geophones to measure the waves and the recording unit that registers the seismic signals and the time of the hammer blow. We start with laying out the measurement profile, but not until we have considered how long the profile should be. The maximum length of the profile from the source at the beginning to the last geophone should be about 5 to 10 times the desired depth of the investigation. Here we have chosen 20 meters so that depth to about 2 to 4 meters can be examined. For hammer seismics, the geophones do not need to be equidistant. For example, it is advantageous to make the distances shorter near the source so that one can also resolve a thin top layer. The distance between the instruments should ideally be shorter than the smallest expected anomaly as well as the smallest wavelength. At wave velocities of 300 meters per second and frequencies of up to 100 hertz, a wavelength of 300 divided by 100 equals 3 meter results. This can easily be undercut. It is important to install the geophones as firmly as possible so that they have a good connection to the ground and are effective at transmitting the movements of the subsurface. The cables connect each individual geophone to the recording unit that records all the ground movements measured. The source excitation is thereby actively induced, so that the hammer seismics also represents an active geophysical method. Passive methods use natural sources of excitation, that means those not produced artificially. A metal plate is used to ensure that the hammer blows connect well with the ground. One source at the start of the profile suffices for examining flat layer boundaries. This is sufficient if we are looking for a flat layer boundary in the subsurface. For inclined layers, one uses an additional source at the end of the profile and for complex structures, sources in several places are used. This hammer is then used to strike the plate. This is initially just a simple sledgehammer, which has a sensor here at the front. This registers the exact time of impact and therefore also the wave excitation, thereby starting the geophone recording via this cable. This means that all recordings of the ground motion, namely the seismograms, start at the time of the impact. After all connections have been checked, the actual measurement begins. To ensure that the measurement signal is as clear as possible, no other vibrations from cars or pedestrians should be present. There are, however, some sources of interference that cannot simply be turned off. Wind that is transmitted through trees into the ground, large machines or distant traffic. The hammer is then struck as briefly as possible and without hitting the metal plate for a second time. To improve the ratio of the signal to background noise, recordings of multiple blows are summated, we say stacked. This is an easy way to create a clear signal without using a particularly strong source. Here you can see at the last geophone of the profile for example how the signal to noise ratio can be improved with each blow. 
This is because most of the background noise is randomly distributed. It is therefore less amplified during the stacking than the coherent waveforms. The excitation with the hammer produces mainly longitudinal P waves, which propagate in the subsurface and are reflected at layer boundaries. The waves reach the geophones and are measured and recorded. From the arrival times of the waves, one can then derive a model of the subsurface that can explain the measured data. To derive a simple model with a layer above the half space below, we use the direct and refracted waves. We can see their course on the left, while their travel times can be seen on the right in the diagram. For the direct wave, the following applies. The further away it is recorded, the longer its travel time. We assume the propagation velocity to be constant, so the line in the travel time diagram appears to be straight. The second ray path we use is that of the refracted wave. It first runs downward, before it is refracted at a critical angle and then propagates along the layer boundary with the higher velocity of the lower medium. At the end of the profile, it arrives at the geophones after the direct wave. From the point of overtaking, it becomes the first impact and can therefore be determined easily. The measurement parameters of the hammer seismics are therefore the travel time of the waves and the derived subsurface or material properties are the seismic wave velocities. I shall show you, using a measurement from an earlier field test in the Hegau, how this can be determined from the travel time diagram. Here you can see the recorded travel time diagram. We can determine the wave velocity of the uppermost layer from the slope of the travel time branch of the direct wave here. V1 equals 1 divided by the slope M1 equals delta T divided by delta X. Here V1 is 440 meters per second. The propagation velocity of the half space is equal to the reciprocal slope of the travel time branch of the refracted wave, V2 equal to 1 divided by M2 equal to 2340 meters per second. Ultimately, the layer depth can then be determined with this data. For this, we need the intercept time T1, which gives the method its name. T1 is just a point of intersection of the extended second straight line with the y-axis. From the geometry of the travel time curve, one can determine that the depth of the layer boundary D then equals V1 times T1 divided by 2 times cosine alpha. Here, alpha is the critical angle of the refraction. In our case, this results in a depth of 8 meters. Similar methods exist for multiple or inclined layers. In order to explore more complex structures, it is also possible to excite surface and S-waves or use other evaluation methods such as full waveform inversion. In addition to scientific questions, hammer seismics are cost-effective for carrying out preliminary investigations of foundation soils or for the determination of static corrections for the near-surface weathering layer in reflection seismics. Today, I have shown you how to set up a hammer seismic measurement. It is important to adapt the length of the profile and the spacing of the geophone to the question at hand. Once the profile is laid down, signals are generated with several hammer blows that are then stacked to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. A simple means of evaluating with a single source position is the intercept time method. By using it, one can determine the wave velocities within a layer and a half space below it, as well as the depth of the layer boundary. Measurements with multiple source positions and different wave types allow the calculation of sophisticated models of the subsurface and thus allow the study of complex structures in the Hegau and elsewhere.